So now I have to destroy the very foundation in which Christianity stands on. And it's going to be real, real, real easy to do so because all you have to do is read the book. So I'm going to get into Jesus dying on the cross. So the whole foundation of Christianity, the whole thing that gets people emotional is Jesus gave his life for your sins. I've explained to you, there are two stories in the Bible. In one story, Jesus dies. In the other story, Jesus does not die on the cross at all. But do you know about the story? Most of you do not know, have never heard of it. But Jesus didn't die on the cross. Now, if you read it the right way, it's really not two stories. It's a continuation of one story. But that's another thing. But there's really two stories here because, you know, you got the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, which for some reason, they all came up with different accounts of the crucifixion and of Jesus life. But Jesus did not die on the cross. Now, let's get into that. Now, it's sad because Jesus did not only survive the cross, but he begged, he prayed and pleaded to God to save him from the cross. And he knew he wasn't going to survive. He knew the whole time he wasn't going to die for your sins. Jesus never dies for your sins on the cross. And that's the sad part that you believe that you get so emotional that he gave his life. Yes, in the book, Jesus did go to the cross. He was tortured and all that, but he survived it. He was scared the whole time. He got bodyguards and he got he got men to go get swords and he got ready to actually fight them off. But he knew this is something that he had to do. But he prayed to God to save him from the cross. And let's listen to what happened. Pay attention because all you got to do is read it. It's in there. Now, look, let's start with Luke 22, 33 through 44. It says, and he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. See, they getting ready. And he said, I tell thee, Peter. The cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We all know about that verse. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse, without money and script and shoes, lack ye anything. And they said nothing. So he said, you know, when I sent you without all this stuff, you didn't have anything. Did you did you need anything? No, I gave you what you needed. So he's saying then say he unto them, but now he that has money, a purse, let him take it. So take your money and he'll, and likewise his script. And he that have no sword, let him sell his garments to buy one. This is Jesus telling them, hey, now I didn't ask y'all to say nothing about money before, but if you got money, go get some swords because he ain't trying to die. He's saying, go sell your clothes, get swords. Let's keep reading. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressions for the things concerning me have an end. See, he understood Jesus knew what was going to come. He know that this thing got to come to an end, but he didn't want it to. You know, he was stressed. Now, 38 says. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them. He left away from them about a stone's cast. So he went a few feet away from them. And he kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Remove this burden from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. So he's saying, get this burden off of me. I don't want to do this, but, you know, let your will be done anyway. But take the burden from me. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Because he probably wasn't going to even make it out there to go to the crucifixion. He was ready to just say, you know what, fuck it. You know, <laughs> I'm ready to fight this off. I'm not trying to die. 
<clears throat> excuse me, but the angel came and strengthened him. And being in, in uh, agony, he prayed more earnestly as his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He was sweating like, oh my God, this shit about to go down. And he's sweating like he's not trying to do this. But we know anyway what happened. He went to the cross and we know. So let's go fast forward to the crucifixion. Jesus is already on the cross. He went through all that bullshit. Let's fast forward and go to John 19, 29 through 34. Now, there was set a vessel of vinegar and they fill a sponge with vinegar. This is very important. And put upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. What the hell is hyssop? What is hyssop? Hmm. Hyssop is a small, brushy, aromatic plant of mint, of the mint family. The bitter minty leaves of which are used in cookery and herbal medicine. So if this man is about to die, why the hell would you give him some medicine? He's there to die. What's you giving him medicine for? In biblical use, a wild shrub or uncertain of, uh, listen, it says in biblical use, a wild shrub of uncertain identity, okay, <laughs> whose twigs were used for sprinkling in ancient Jewish rites of purification. What the hell you want to purify him for? The man is going to die. He's on the cross to die. So let's go back to John. 19, 29 through 34, let's read verse 30. It says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now understand, it, on the Sabbath, can't nobody be hanging up on the cross. You can't be up there. You can't be up there on the Sabbath uh, hanging up on the cross. It's not good. It's a holy day. So what was supposed to happen was they were supposed to break the legs of the people that was on the cross so they can't run away or try to escape and then continue the crucifixion later. So Pilate knew this. And it's one of the weird things because remember, Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. Remember, his wife told him, hey, I'm having bad dreams about this man. Let that man go. So you know, Pilate knew that, OK, he's going to be on the cross, probably not a long time. So he might survive. So he said, you know, go ahead. And he knew that they would have to come to him and say to ask permission to bring him down. And I think this is my thought. And this is a lot of uh, other scholars thought thinking in the story that Pilate was going to then let Jesus go or set him free because he knew he wasn't going to be on the cross long enough to die. And Pilate's. Uh, his reaction later will show you that he didn't think Jesus was going to die on the cross. But, you know, let's keep going. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and other and the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now, this is really important because remember, I was telling you in our earliest, the earliest version of the New Testament, the earliest version. Remember, this verse, John 29, 34 was not in here. Uh, but one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side and went forth. That wasn't in there. When a soldier spear him, it wasn't originally in John. It was in Matthew. It was in the book of Matthew. The reason why they put it here, and I told you before, I was going to explain why they put this here. Because if you do not put this verse here, if this verse was not here, there is no way Jesus dies. And it's obvious that he's alive. But this verse is to put, it was put here deliberately to confuse you. Because now they got you thinking, one, he pierced Jesus, so that killed him. If he was alive when he stabbed him with that with that uh, spear, he would have up, uh, he would have jerked or said something or made some kind of noise or screamed if he was alive. But understand, they put that verse there because Jesus was faking. He was alive the whole time. He was unconscious. He was faking. Without this verse that wasn't originally here, 
it's clear that he survived. Now it's weird too that John is the only chapter that mentions Lazarus. The whole Lazarus thing and rising from the dead. You gotta understand this is a metaphorical story here, but we're gonna get into it. And if you're not convinced yet, trust me, you will be as we go along. Okay, so now it's gonna to start to get a lot more clear here that Jesus didn't die. If you ain't convinced yet, you will be. But you need to understand, I, I've explained in the video, Jesus is the son, S-U-N, not the son, about the whole winter solstice and how it parallels the story of Jesus on the cross. Yeah, the whole cross of the zodiac. But where did the actual story of a man dying on a cross come from? Where did they get it from? Now, let's go into Mark 15, uh, verses 43 through 45. This is Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled. Think about it. He marveled if he were already dead. He so mar he marveled. He was like, what? Jesus is dead. So he asked the centurion and he said, you know, how long has, has Jesus been dead? It says, whether he had been any while dead, he asked the centurion, how long has he been dead? Because he's shocked. He knew that he's not going to be on the cross all day, you know, because the Sabbath coming. So they got to take his body down. So he knew that it, he's no way he should be dead. So he, when he found out from the centurion, as it says in 45, that he was dead, he gave the body to Joseph. So where did the story come from? Where did the story of three men on a cross being crucified come from? Now, it's not just any old story. You got Jesus on the cross and you got two other men. It's three men being crucified. So where could we find something like this at? And the only place you can find it before your Bible was written comes from the man who wrote it. Comes from the life of Flavius Josephus. Now, when I found this story, it blew me away. I was shocked like this because first of all, one, this was written way before your Bible was put together. It was written before your New Testament. So I'm like, this is obviously where the story came from. Now, when you actually read the story, it's in this book, The Life of Flavius Josephus. It's no way you can't tell me this is where the story comes from. Now it says, Life 76. And when I was sent by Titus Caesar, and the Cerulians and a thousand horsemen to a certain village called the, the Koa in order to know whether it were a place fit for a camp. As I came back, I saw many captives crucified. He saw many captives crucified and remembered three of them as my former acquaintances. So there we go. We got the three men right there. I was very sorry at this in my mind and went with tears in my eyes to Titus. So he goes to Titus. So here you have Josephus going to Titus. There you had Joseph going to Pilate. What's going on? Now let's continue. It says, and told him of them. So immediately commanded them to be taken down. So Titus said, take them down and to have the greatest care taken of them in order to recover. So here you have three men being taken down and give them good care so they can recover. Listen to what I'm saying. So they can recover great care. Okay, let's keep saying. Yet two of them died under the physician's hands while the third recovered. So one lived. We know who lived. Jesus lived. And I'm going to prove it to you. But look at the story. Come on. If you can't wrap your hand around this, it's before your New Testament. This is where it came from. It came from the man we've been talking about who gave you your Bible in the first place, Flavius Titus Josephus. With the help or with the permission from Titus and whoever else helped him to give the, the Hebrews their New Testament. Now, understand, we don't need that story. We don't need the whole thing about the life of Josephus to prove what I'm about to show you here, because what it says in the Bible is exactly, almost to a T, what Josephus wrote in his autobiography. And common sense should tell you, you got Joseph of Arimathea, and you got Josephus Barimathea. That's another name for Josephus, but I don't want to get into that part. But when you research jo Josephus Barimathea, you have found out that that's Joseph 
of Arimathea. You'll find out that Josephus Barimathea is Titus Flavius Josephus. But I don't want to use that part. I want to be fair and give Christians a little bit of, you know, leeway here. But we're going to just leave that out. Let's pretend like it's the court of law. We're going to leave that out, even though the jury already heard it.